Hello and welcome to another edition of the Ducks Confidential Podcast. I'm James Crepia, joined, as always, by Ryan Clark. And we'll be getting into uh, a variety of things as it's uh, it's been a minute since we last joined you. Uh, but that was mainly due to just uh, some logistical things on our end um, and whatnot. But bottom line, the uh, obviously, the basketball seasons have concluded the uh, transfer portal is a humming uh, and will continue to be uh, across the country uh, in college basketball men's women's college basketball uh, and of course uh, spring football practice very much underway uh, and that is where we'll start we will get to basketball but uh, since we are in uh, quite literally the midst of uh, spring football and uh, believe it or not actually nearing the midpoint uh, of spring football even though uh, the ducks have uh, all three of their spring scrimmages still to come the first uh, on this Saturday, as we record here on uh, Wednesday uh, afternoon, and of course the spring game on the 27th. So the next couple of Saturdays they'll have some scrimmages, and of course the with the culmination being the spring game. But uh, Ryan, in terms of uh, what we've heard so far, I don't want to go by what we've seen because, as we've uh, as we, we all know, as many of the fan knows, and for those who do not, <laughs> uh, we don't usually get to see very much. Uh, that's not a complaint; that's just reality uh, by way of practice. Uh, not not a lot necessarily uh, to glean there, but. Uh, in terms of what we have heard uh, from both Dan Lanning and his staff and uh, players so far over the last uh, week or so, since the Ducks got back from spring break and, and whatnot, uh, what has stood out to you? Of course, we'll get into the running backs coach change separately, but outside of the uh, Carlos Lachlan to Rashad Samples uh, transition that's coming uh, and, and is going on and well, we have yet to hear from running back, so we'll get to that. But that aside, uh, what else has uh, stood out to you from uh, spring practice and what we've uh, heard from coaches and players thus far? Yeah, I mean, setting aside Lachlan and Cookie Emoji Gate or whatever you want to <laughs> call the last uh, 24 hours in his discussion. Uh, now, obviously, him joining up with Ohio State. But uh, it, it was it was nice yesterday to hear from Dylan Gabriel for the first time. I, I think that, you know, you can really – hear and and sort of feel the the five years of you know experience in college football with a guy like that right you know obviously being from hawaii there's there's sort of the easygoing lifestyle that's built in but he's he's somebody that really does seem easygoing and uh has has an interesting personality and is someone that i think uh duck fans are going to be excited to get to know this year you know they they had the, the sort of bo nix rental for a couple of years and that was a lot of fun for them to to get to know him his personality his family uh and, and I think that, you know, Dylan Gabriel is somebody that has an opportunity to endear himself to, to Oregon fans this year, particularly if he has the kind of success on the field that a lot of experts uh, around college football think he will have. Um, but it was, it was nice to speak to him yesterday. Good to hear from, from Dan Lanning, obviously, after an eventful offseason uh, for him uh, to hear from his staff uh, throughout spring football so far um starting to in in many ways and and you know this can veer into cliche at times but to, to sort of lay out the vision for the program as or program as some may pronounce it uh, as they enter uh this this third year um so it's 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 been an interesting couple of weeks you know for me getting back from from vacation obviously i was i was disappearing overseas for the start of uh, everything this spring but came back in time for these these official practices and uh you know it's been good it's been good to hear from people in the program uh and and to get to know some new faces while also obviously um seeing how how the returners are, are adjusting to to things so yeah and uh, and and certainly uh, again the, to your point that uh, dylan gabriel will certainly i think endear himself to to oregon fans uh, over time yes we did hear from him for the first time yesterday and we'll have uh, uh lots uh from that conversation and and prior conversations with members of the staff and players in terms of uh you know, what they've had to say about uh, each other, about him, about how he's handled things so far in spring practice, about um, for the players who have worked out with him separately, uh, both uh, really <laughs> very early in his time uh, upon arriving at Oregon uh, back in January and including during spring break, uh, multiple uh, receivers. Yeah, and he I, made a serious effort yeah, on that. Yeah. Like he, he genuinely went out of his way, which, you know, a, a guy that's transferring in that is sort of out for his own 
situation and trying to up his draft stock or whatever whatever selfish motivation one might have he they aren't doing stuff like that so you know he seems very bought into the program in general just based on on what he said and, and what he's done yeah and it's one thing to do it on your own and, and put in time and that's certainly uh admirable commendable etc so level commitment seriousness professionalism etc etc uh, but to go out and not just work on your own as one might do with private coaches as many quarterbacks do uh, but it is another thing to bring with you your receivers uh, and not just one and not just two, but a gaggle of receivers uh, for a weekend or for multiple days during spring break. Uh, that's different. That's different because, you know, going, going down to work with a private quarterback coach and, and like and throw the ball around. Believe me, you, you can find receivers wherever it is that you're going, whether it was Bo going to work in uh, South Alabama in Gulf Shores, or it's still in, working in Southern California, you know, they, they can find some receivers, whether they're former college players, current college players, Division II guys, high school guys, whatever the case is, you, you can find people to go catch the ball for you. But when you bring in your own guys, uh, particularly guys who you're trying to quickly develop chemistry with, uh, develop relationships with on and off the field uh, and the like, that speaks volumes. That is something that's different. Now, some of that comes with, yeah, he's a six-year guy, uh, undoubtedly. But that speaks to, you know, how he goes about his business. And these are things that are not necessarily new for Dylan Gabriel uh, simply because he has come to Oregon. But it is something he has done uh, in his first call what it is. Uh, <laughs> he's been sitting here, ironically enough, on April 10th, uh, pretty much 100 days uh, since he's arrived and and been at the university more or less uh since first 100 days is a sort of presidential uh situation for, for yeah, Mr. Gabriel. Analogy, but like yeah, that's, who, that's who knows maybe it. maybe maybe by the time uh fall rolls around and there are a few games into that big 10 schedule maybe people will be uh campaigning for him to be president we'll see uh, but... well, i think they'll <laughs> suffice for the heisman uh if yeah, uh, they'll, if they'll take that they'll, they'll, they'll go for that <laughs> um but no, like I say, that that stands out. You know, those those kinds of actions um, stand out. And then you get into the words and the poise and the presence of, you know, what what does, uh, uh, you know, you don't win a press conference as a player or a coach per se, but, you know, it comes off that you're talking to somebody who's not just, you know, who's been around the block, who's played, who's played very well, uh, and who's been in the spot before. And that, that comes across. And we'll be hearing from Dante Moore as well. And to be clear, like, you know, we're not making and passing all kinds of judgments one way or the other, but you got to call it what it is. Um, Dylan Gabriel came here to be the starting quarterback. And, yeah. I mean, that's that's just what it is. And everything that he's done so far uh, off the field and, and in these uh, moments, like I say, and working with teammates has illustrated that. And I don't think there's really much uh, debate or discussion to be had. That doesn't mean that things can't be competitive in a practice. That doesn't mean that Dante Moore is an, also a very, very talented player. But – you brought in a 60 year senior who's thrown for thousands upon thousands of yards and was one of the better quarterbacks in college football last year and was the top quarterback in the transfer portal for a reason. And yeah. let's just call it what it is. Um, and Dante previously has talked about, you know, we'll hear from him in the not too distant future, but he has previously spoken of wanting to be developed and the like. And this is this year certainly would serve as an opportunity if he is the backup to Dylan to develop at a pace to probably still play a significant number of games, maybe even more than four games in redshirting. Uh, because if everything goes according to plan, Oregon is going to be at a significant advantage against many of the teams on its schedule. Uh, so there will probably be ample opportunities for a backup quarterback to play and not just play at you know the end of a fourth quarter kind of thing. But that's for you know months and months and months from now. For now, for a first conversation with Dylan, certainly a lot of those things stood out. Oh, one other thing that stood out to me, and again, this is, this is good, bad, or otherwise, it just is. Um, you know, Dylan Gabriel is not six foot five. I mean, that that you know that already. Um, <laughs> yeah. Look, he was in socks. I, to be fair, he was. In, he was. <laughs> I will say, in the right in the right pair of shoes, uh, I I could probably embellish myself to be six foot tall. Okay, On, and and. In the exact right pair, maybe, maybe yeah, I could stretch. I've been five eleven and like three quarters say, for I've, basically I've, my whole I life. Say, so. I've, it, 
I'm probably generously uh, uh, listed at 5'11", probably closer to the 5'10 and change, okay? Uh, I am taller than Dylan Gabriel. Now, that does not mean one thing or another. I, that, that, I'm not saying anything about ability to play or how that relates to the NFL or anything else. I'm just saying if you, have, if you know nothing else, if you are a casual fan, and you have looked at and seen he was listed at six foot tall at UCF, which should not surprise you, given <laughs> that, that maybe certain programs may embellish some measurements. Uh, and then seen him listed at 5'11 at Oklahoma uh, in cleats and a helmet. Uh, I have no doubt that Dylan might might be able to stretch to that point. Uh, but flat footed. Uh, no, he was not. But. Be that as it may, uh, that, you know, upon first meeting him, you know, again, knowing that he's not somebody who's going to tower over you like a Justin Herbert did. Um, yeah, it, it, it did strike me that like, oh, OK, yes, he is. He probably is about five tennis, maybe even five nine. Does that mean anything good, bad or otherwise? No, just means that he's not the prototypical, you know, six foot three, six foot four. Uh, it's an observation. It's an observation. Yes. yes. And uh, for that matter. <laughs> Probably helps a little bit in his mobility and escape ability, given his size. Uh, and, you know, running is a significant part of his game. Uh, yeah. And escaping the pocket is a significant part of his game. And not for nothing, being a six foot four quarterback uh, may or may not help you uh, in that regard. Uh, so, observationally, again, uh, he, he's built the way he is uh, from a physical standpoint, but in terms of uh, uh, mentally and dealing with media and whatever in our initial conversation with him uh, yesterday. Uh, some of those things that uh, some of the observations that we had had uh, some others uh, so far, obviously they've brought in almost all of their transfers at this point, just Brandon Johnson from Duke uh, safety from Duke uh, yet to arrive. Now, that'll be happening later on because he has to finish up academics at Duke before getting here. But otherwise everybody else is here. Evan Stewart and uh, Jabbar Muhammad arriving uh, after spring break, which was, I don't know, for some, I, I, I can't keep track in the Twitterverse of who's who, who knows what they're talking about and who doesn't. More often than not, it's the latter. Um, but for for some people, I don't know. That was apparently surprising that 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 uh, <laughs> that players who didn't even commit to Oregon until winter quarter had been well underway uh, were, were not here yet. But be that as it may, they're here now. Uh, and so far in the you know very brief time uh, that they've been here. Uh, Evan Stewart sounds like he's already been making a couple of a uh, couple of plays and making a very very quick uh, and early uh, first impression uh, about the kind yeah. of athleticism. Yeah, that you've he's already bringing. heard heard more rumblings maybe than one might expect in in the sort of tight tight quarters that is uh, those practices. Now there also is motivation, obviously, to uh, to hype up somebody like Evan, who you know is a guy that you know comes in with a lot of potential and a lot of track record of success. Right, he's a guy that that one would expect to to be the number one receiver this year and to to put up big numbers and be a go-to guy for for dylan yeah i have a feeling that uh as but not just by the end of spring but in general look this is a, a receiving core that is basically a split between uh older experienced uh proven players uh many of them transfers and uh a lot of freshmen uh and and the room is basically split almost down the middle in that regard. Uh, now, Evan Stewart is you know, one of those transfers. He's a junior by eligibility purposes. Uh, so he comes in. You already have Tez coming off, you know, an 1,100-yard season. Uh, and you know what you got there. And obviously, Garen Bryan Jr. and Treshawn Holden are coming back, transfers from a year ago. So they're established by way of uh, at the top of the depth chart, uh, seemingly, uh, that they have, yes, ex experience and proven players there is a influx of freshmen where it will be interesting to see throughout the rest of spring uh who does stand out and who raises their game to be in the five and six lines uh on the two deep who get to be uh the number twos at their respective positions uh that's not something we're going to get a public declaration about or anything but i think it becomes pretty obvious and, and apparent uh in the spring game by the way the roster is composed and who, you know, gets reps accordingly. But hearing a lot about Jurion Dickey as well, we had heard that during bowl practice that, hey, he's really taking it up a notch now with, with the time that was there ahead of the Fiesta Bowl. And he is only built upon that even more. Uh, and to hear from all the receivers in particular, but hearing from Tez Johnson, 
and then hearing from Junior Adams, receivers coach, that, yeah, here's a guy who we know he came in last year and was coming off an injury, and he was behind, and he was struggling, and it was tough for him to try to learn the playbook real quick because the proverbial drinking out of a fire hose and, and coming in late and every which other th- later coming in, <laughs> coming in at the normal time, which is now late uh, in college football, arriving in the summer. And to them, by the end of the season, be healthy, know what you're doing, and to be able to go out there and play a little bit, got a little bit of run in the, in the bowl game, a little bit. But this is the former five-star who now seemingly, you know, both off the field in the meeting room, helping teach younger players where he was, this is his first spring. He wasn't here a year ago. And learning was th- something that was, you know, a challenge for him at first, not, you know, mainly from, from just the speed of things. Now he's bringing along younger guys less than a year in, in his first spring. That, those are the kinds of things you, you want to hear as a, as a fan uh, that, oh, yeah, by the way, uh, you know, this, this is not a player who, uh, it's not because of lack of talent or lack of desire or want to or work ethic. Uh, he was just coming in off the injury and it was what it was. But now he's putting himself in position to make plays and is making plays and is helping bring along the rest of uh, the younger guys in a room. That's significant. That's enormous. So we're talking about, yes, there are those four proven commodities who are transfers who come in, who have track records, who've produced previously both here and elsewhere, who will join them. Uh, Jurion Dickey seems like he's absolutely going to be one of those guys. And then it becomes who else is in there. Is it uh, Kyle Casper or Justice Lowe, who are redshirt sophomores in their own right? Or is it one of the four freshmen who've arrived uh, who are all obviously pretty highly touted guys in, in their own regard. So one of the many positions uh, that there's uh, uh, intrigue, uh, most certainly in terms of what the roster will look like and, and what the rest of spring and the offseason will look like in terms of uh, personnel. Uh, but it's probably one of the few of them in terms of offense because running backs, while there's a, a coach change, we'll get to in a moment. In quarterback, yes, it's a restock, and that obviously draws attention. I think there's less there's less drama I think a quarterback, when when you really think about it, then then I think some would like to create simply because, well, you're losing a, a, a terrific quarterback in Bo Nix, uh, and what are you going to do? Well, I think I think what Oregon is going to do is pretty clear uh, at the quarterback position. Uh, running back, they return guys. Yes, they lose a Bucky Irving, but they return guys. Uh, receiver, they lose Troy Franklin. They return significant players, but bring in a lot of new, uh, you know, really talented young guys. Offensive line, yes, they, they do lose two guys, including Jackson Powers Johnson, who's the best center in the country. But they have answers. <laughs> they have answers immediately. Uh, so there's a reason why Oregon is uh, considered to be, at this point in all of these early rankings and betting markets and the like, to be uh, projected to be one of the best teams in the Big Ten, if not the country, because they do have all these answers uh, on offense. Now, to the running back position, which we'll get to, uh, Yes, uh, the move from Carlos Lachlan, who leaves to go to Ohio State, where he spoke for the first time uh, earlier today. Uh, And moving on to Rashad Samples from Arizona State. He comes into Oregon staff, and we're awaiting contract details and the like, but he is on staff, and he was at practice on Tuesday. Your thoughts, uh, Ryan, on the the move that is and was and uh, what this could mean to uh, the running back room and recruiting and the like. Yeah, I mean, obviously Lachlan is a major loss and somebody that had a great deal of success in that position, coached a lot of great running backs in his time at Oregon. But I think that you you could do a lot worse than Rashad Samples, right? And I don't just say that as an Arizona State University alum. That is, <laughs> that is a guy that, you know, under Kenny Dillingham at ASU um, was – integral to a lot of what they did on the recruiting front and you see it even this week with a lot of different guys being asked about Rashad around ASU there's no there's no ill will there's no silent next questioning of anything that's a guy that garnered a lot of respect around Tempe and and played an integral role for for Kenny Dillingham so on the recruiting front I think Samples one could argue might might bring even more on in that and his connections to Texas and everything else uh, than, than he will in terms of a 
you know, leading a running back room that has a lot of experience that, you know, I, I believe Dan Lanning was asked about that sort of transition, the idea that the, the running back room has so much experience that Samples doesn't have to come in and set the tone on day one. He can be part of a collaborative experience in, in the running back room. So um, I think it's a, it's a great hire, frankly, uh, to, to bring Rashad in. And uh, we'll, we'll see how it impacts the, the sort of foundation that Lanning and his staff have set on that front. But um, you know, obviously, we'll we'll see how things go for Lachlan uh, alongside uh, old friend Chip Kelly over at uh, Ohio State. So, yeah, I think uh, ultimately um, that there's a bit, you know, there is a business side to all of this, and again, it gets complicated when it happens at the time that it does, and there's certainly things that can be revisited uh, in the future. Um, and, and asked Dan about that at the time, you know, last week when uh, right after uh, Lachlan had, had left for Ohio State, of do you look to revisit uh, the the timing of uh, the the buyout clauses in uh, assistant coach contracts to to better prevent and curb uh, movement during the course of spring practice uh, because the buyouts were for all the assistants, not just for Carlos Lachlan, for all the assistants, uh, the buyouts were more significant up until April 1st and then came down basically almost across the board. Uh, I think Will Stein may have a slightly different uh, structure, but bottom line, basically across the board to 50% uh, from 100% of their remaining salaries uh, after April 1st up until some point off into the future, usually until the end of uh, the, this current contract year, which would be after January uh, of 25. And you know, Dan didn't say yes or no to that. He just said, you know, he's more focused on guys who want to be here and the like, et cetera. And that's all fine and well and good. But to the business side element of it, yeah, when you lose an assistant on uh, on the day that the buyout changes uh, and, you know, there were overtures uh, from other places before that and part of what prevented his departure earlier was uh, a very prohibitive buyout. And then you go, well, are you better off making the buyout the more you know more prohibitive at least through May 1st or basically does April 1st make sense for the buyout aspect of things and the business element of it all would yeah, you rather what did the communications look like behind the scenes right. too or lack thereof right. and basically do you want would you rather have the buyout uh, 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 be prohibitive up until March 1st and then hey look if you want to go go and, and then and then we can make change. We the pervert, whoever the we is, whoever the institution is, we could talk about any school could want this. School loses an assistant in March or you know, early March. Okay, well, spring practice may or may not have started depending on the school. Arizona State being a place one of a couple that actually starts a little bit earlier, but okay, whatever. Uh, whether spring practice has started or not, it probably hasn't. Especially at Oregon, it hasn't. So therefore. Uh, better able to make a hire and still have continuity. They get, you know, hit the ground running. They are not missing X number of practices. They're able to learn personnel and the like. And, you know, you can go from there. Or do you want to push the date back further so that to say, keep everybody or better, have a better chance to keep everybody. And by the time you get to May 1st, quite frankly, barring something totally like way, way, way unusual and cataclysmic. You're not going to have a power four coaching staff that has a coaching opening. The NFL's done. Their coaching staffs are set. The draft is done. So coaching in, in that realm is set. There's no more movement. Across college football, most of the coaching movement happens in December and January. The fact that a couple of moves were still to be had at this juncture... Why, why did it, why, why did this series of dominoes occur? Because Jim Harbaugh left Michigan to go to the Chargers after the championship game. And then Sharon Moore moved up. And then they had to make moves. And then they hired Alfred from Ohio State. And that happened when it did in March. And Ohio State has an opening all of a sudden, later than it anticipated having an opening, certainly. And then all of a sudden, they've got to fill a job. And it, it goes from there. But it all traces back to, yeah, because Jim Harbaugh was coaching in the national championship game in the middle of January. 
And even though most everybody expected him to leave, um, you know, how Sharon Moore was going to fill out Michigan staff and, and the ripple effects thereafter was how and why we got to this point. Well, so, so Oregon fans can blame Jim Harbaugh then. There you go. The, uh, but, okay. but truly, like, how do you better curb that in an expanded playoff world to where the national championship is going to be as late, if not later, in the future? Well, either have assistant coach contracts where the buyouts are prohibitive up until an earlier date and say, again, if, hey, if you want to go on, okay, and we'll be better able to adjust accordingly. Or to have it so prohibitive later and say, if you're going to go and get our guy before it's conducive to us, you're, you're going to pay a, a, a king's ransom to do that. And that's just going to, you know, so basically, if you're committed to a staff, you're committed to a staff, period, and it's going to be bordering on the impossible for you to leave. So if you're making the commitment, you're committed. This is, this is what the contract says. And if you're going to get out and somebody's going to come along, not only are they going to have to pay you, uh, they're going to have to pay us a, a gargantuan sum of money. That's the business element to it all. And I'm sure Carlos Locken got paid well to go to Ohio State, and good for him. And we'll see exactly, we'll wait the contract details on Rashad Samples, but I'd heard uh, from multiple avenues now uh, that he was make, in line to make. He had made 500000 uh, 500, at ASU last year, and it signed a... Uh, uh, contract extension with a raise to 600 for the upcoming year Lachlan had signed an extension for 400 at Oregon so well you know we, we can surmise in, in the interim but clearly between what Lachlan was making what samples was due to make uh, and the 360 ish thousand and change that Ohio State paid Oregon uh, for Lachlan's buyout I think you can see where uh, uh, samples contract is likely to end up and again we'll get those details in the days ahead exactly but it ended up being point of one all. total uh, one Damian Martinez basically is the, <laughs> is the exchange That's the new rate. unit of measure um, uh, uh, allegedly and uh, reportedly uh, on, on that side of things. Yes, yeah. of course. And look, um, there is a business side element to it all. Uh, now it gets into the, yes, the back and forth and, and Lachlan talking uh, for the first time today to Ohio State media. So it came up in a couple of questions in Columbus about uh, the soft batch cookie reference that he had made uh, while at Oregon, uh, you know, a year or so ago. Uh, talking about, uh, you know, and then saying, well, it wasn't really about the transfer portal and players transferring. It was about a, a, a mindset and a mentality uh, more so than that. You go, well, okay, but what you said nearly a year ago to the day when you first made this remark and, and reference um, was that there is a bakery for said soft batch cookies, and it's called the transfer portal. So... That's his words. Yes. And look, at the time, <laughs> and, and at the time, Oregon fans, as Ohio State fans are now, literally eating it up, loving it. That's great. Wonderful. Uh, and it doesn't matter whether it is or it isn't. What, this, is, this is college football. This is part of it. You ask an NFL fan, even the most diehard of NFL fans who their running backs coaches, almost none of them could, could name the running backs coach of the – the, the team they love that's just the, it's a different element because there's no recruiting because it's a different deal all right, right. No, no matter if they coach 10 multi-thousand yard running backs in, in an nfl coach's career that doesn't matter they have no idea what the assistants are in college football they know them all by name know their recruiting prowess know their entire history and freak out whether they uh they're coming and going and how much money they make all right well, so be it if <laughs> as long as it works for his players whether it works for fans media or the like Fine. So, so be it. To the, to the young men in the room who he coaches, if it works for them, outstanding. It certainly seems like it worked for people uh, in the albeit brief time he was at uh, Western Kentucky for a year. It seemed like it obviously worked for whether it be Bucky Irving, Noah Whittington, who followed him from Western Kentucky out to Oregon, or Jordan James in his first two years here. Did it work for everybody? Eh, maybe not. But we'll see. Now there's the back and forth, though, about – that reference then there's this thing about you know he, he likes being called lock and dan here there or otherwise would have called him by his first name and that's a thing whether okay. clearly this is what was a <laughs> a very productive and good couple of years from carlos lock and from a, a running back position uh output perspective what was pretty good 
In recruiting, that you might be able to quibble with a little bit, particularly this past cycle. But, and all told, you had success with Bucky Irving. Things were pretty good. And Dan last week was quite complimentary. And also saying it's an opportunity to get better and you go and you try to do that. And fans can certainly feel they have with Rashad Samples. Time will tell. For, For sure. things it- to now kind of get into this messiness uh in in the in this in you know through, through no one's fault but their own you know just to, for for Lachlan to now be saying some of these things that's going to draw the ire of some Oregon fans these days well that's it'll make uh the the <laughs> it'll make this season's game a little bit more intriguing it'll make our jobs easier i, I wonder what we'll write about uh, yeah the, people yeah. live for for the little the, the drama the little miniature dramas right but just on the on the point of like soft batch cookies or soft baked cookies or or whatever it might be. I mean, I personally just speaking to that, I prefer a cookie to be a little underdone than, than maybe a, an over. So you are so from chips Ahoy, you want the chewies. Yes. Unquestionably the, the dry ones. I mean, I, I had them in my lunch when I was a kid, but you know, those, those ones are, are more for, for convenience's sake than I think for quality. I'm more of an underbaked cookie person myself, setting aside all metaphors that might be there for, for calling someone soft or whatever your specific idea about masculinity and your decision-making regarding your college football career. Or professional cookie. aspirations or, or anything professional else. professional aspirations. Uh, I, I, I just prefer an underbaked cookie. That's just my take. I, uh, mo- more often than not, someone offers me a cookie, I, I, I'm not asking any questions thereafter. Um, that, that's, <laughs> that, that may or may not be a problem, which is why a I, co- I, I... A cookie I, is a cookie. Yeah, that is, I, I that try, is a fair I, point. Yeah, I, I try not to keep too many of them in the house to, uh, you know, I know, <laughs> know thyself, uh, prevent, you know... <laughs> don't don't keep the suits around if you're uh, you know if you're going to stop kind of thing. Though I have to admit the Girl Scout cookies that is that is a major weakness. That is a major oh, no weakness. doubt that no doubt hard hard to pass up. <laughs> on a, on a more serious note and the like, uh, we'll we'll shift gears and again we'll obviously be conversing about uh, spring football and the like in the uh, in the weeks ahead, and we'll get more into the defense and other stuff. And yes, we've heard from some defensive coaches and both Tasha Lepoy and Chris Hampton. And so we'll, we'll get to more. But believe me, we we, we can get. <laughs> We'll have more podcasts, uh, but to shift gears to uh, to basketball, since uh, uh, yes, since last we spoke, obviously a, a really nice tournament run uh, for Oregon men's basketball, reaching uh, the second round and uh, pushing it to double overtime with one of the great uh, one of the great tandem performances uh, in not forget about program history or this year's tournament, probably in NCAA tournament history, and it shouldn't be lost to the annals uh, and of box scores and, and select fan bases uh, that what Jermaine Cousinard and Folly Dante did uh, against Creighton in the second half and, and overtimes of that game, that should not just be lost uh, to Oregon and Creighton fans. Uh, that was one of the most remarkable <laughs> and, and bordering on outrageous uh, performances from Two men who put, I mean, you were talking about the proverbial, like going out on your shield, uh, 37 of the last 39 points and taking nearly every shot and all, you know, the assists, the rebound, every which thing from the set playing every minute, both of them. From yeah, the second both half of those guys. I mean, it, it was amazing. Like it was, especially in folly, given what he's, you know, given to the program over the years, you know, that, that tournament run for him felt like a love letter to Eugene love letter to, to U of O in a lot of ways. And yeah, Kuznard was such a beast. Both of those games, just phenomenal. Um, you know, being able to watch those, uh, remotely from Japan at, at strange hours of the, of the day, uh, I, I got a chance to, to take in those games and, and it was, it was remarkable. And it, I think a credit to Dana Altman, obviously, who's had his share of success in, in the tournament, but those two guys, man, wow. I mean, Dante and Kuznard, what an imprint that they, you know, they left on this program. And again, had they, had they won that game and beaten Creighton and gone to the sweet 16 uh, and it just basically had the outcome been ever so slightly different and that whether Dante knocks down the free throw late in regulation, if the inbound didn't go to him in the first place and it went elsewhere, if they didn't foul or it, it was a messy final 90 seconds of regulation. But regardless, 
or had for that matter had Jermaine knocked down a shot that uh, it, it was a difficult one, but you know had they won on that, uh, be it all as it may, it lives more in history because of the outcome if it's a victory, obviously. But that's why I say it should not be lost to the annals simply because it was a loss because what they did was so extraordinary and so unheard of to see two guys put forth the stat line uh, that they did in the second half and overtimes of that game was so, so obscene. <laughs> it's just so, like I say, like in the course of watching it, I was going, I, I, I forget about what I had seen in person that had long since eclipsed it. It was, it was a matter of, I had no awareness of any instance. Uh, and then after the game, seeing and you know for the the statistical services and the like who put out and are able to compile it all that know that at least in the last 25 years uh, there had never been anything like that and then you know before that stats are sometimes hard to come by and in, in terms of um quickly sorting through but you know the history of the three-point line and shot clock and other things and it's probably a pretty safe assumption that if it had happened before in either the 80s or 90s it probably only happened once if it happened at all it may not have ever happened uh what you saw from the two of them in the second half and overtimes of that game that was that level of extraordinary and it was really fitting uh for them you wish you wish for their sake that it had been in victory because uh they deserved that much more uh attention and praise um and and you know, positive emotions about what was uh, a remarkable performance, but a heck of a run regardless. And, uh, and we'll certainly hear uh, from them in the not too distant future. Uh, I think about just, yes, the, the, the this was the end of the seasons and the like, but you know, what, where, where their future is going to end up taking them and, and the like, probably I would imagine we may or may not hear from them in uh, hopefully sometime next week <clears throat> as the uh, Oregon men's basketball staff uh, make some adjustments as well as Tony Stubblefield returns. Uh, which had uh, been in the works for some time, uh, basically from the, more or less from the day that uh, that he was let go at DePaul, uh, that was uh, in the works. And uh, alas, uh, yes, Tony Subblefield, uh, who'd spent 11 years at Oregon and was uh, obviously a terrific recruiter at Oregon, terrific recruiter, not just alone, but with uh, Mike Menica, who's still on the staff uh, and is uh, expected back as well. They, they were quite the duo on the recruiting trail. And uh, to get them back together, with the staff that uh, still returns uh, virtually everybody else as well. Uh, again, we'll yeah, not a very well kept secret yeah. <laughs> there it seemed. <laughs> yeah, and, and and there could be either more additions or adjustments and the like between uh, Brian Fish had moved back to being a, a on court and recruiting assistant. This year, last year, he was in a uh, uh, assistant role that was starting to morph where the the NCAA expanded uh, the ability to uh, have five assistants, three who would go on the road recruiting, two others who would not. Uh, so uh, Fish was in a uh, administrative role that was setting up for that. He went to a recruiting role this year. In addition to assistant, he could end up going back to, we'll see what that may entail for him. Kevin McKenna had already done that. We'll see. Again, Menica, his contract's up in June, but he's very much expected to be back. And uh, it's now Stubblefield back. So Lewis Rowe's contract was up uh, as of 10 days ago. And as of earlier this week there had not been a move there but i think some of it still has to do with bringing tony back contractually and sorting out everybody's roles and some of that just getting shifted around while the transfer portal is very much underway uh brendan rigsby and Kerry oquindo going in and we're still uh still got a few more days of the portal being open here uh in in college basketball so, so we'll see if there's any additional movement but it sounds like that could be it uh, as far as the Oregon men's basketball is concerned, on the women's side, uh, after what was long since discussed and, and uh, drilled home that it was a uh, epically disappointing season and, uh, and a poor run, obviously did not have any kind of postseason, that uh, the departures uh, were exactly, if you were to lose anybody from the roster that was, uh, they were exactly who you did not want to lose in that it was Grace Van Sluten and Chance Gray, uh, Ke uh, Kennedy Basham leaving as well. Uh, Priscilla Williams had hopped in um, uh, even a couple days before them. So the bottom line is uh, for Oregon women's basketball, uh, they are in a world of hurt by way of uh, personnel right now. Yes, yeah, Peyton Scott comes to... off injury, no. but uh, and they, they had a, a transfer so far. They've got one addition um, in, in one of the nation's leaders in steals. 
uh, from Siena last year. But quite literally, it's it's Peyton Scott and their new incomer and, you know, Philly Shea at the moment and a couple of freshmen, and, and that's about it. Uh, there's there's not much there's not much else uh, on the roster as of today. Again, lots of things that will be changing in the days and weeks ahead as they will undoubtedly be adding via the portal. Yeah, they have a lot of work to do in that portal, and there's a lot of you know talent out there for sure. You know, you think about you know players that might leave some of the the more contending programs that are seeking more opportunities to be the player for for a program um you know if if oregon's program still has that cachet and and elite players still want to come here which you know given the way the last couple of years have gone there is a question there for sure um that there is an opportunity to to improve your team right now but right now it it hangs in the balance and you wonder you know which which way the tides are going to turn for for kelly graves and company because obviously this was a, a brutal season and we've gone on at length about the 14 straight losses the awful result in the final game against colorado in the pac-12 tournament um but but it does i think go go deeper than that when you look at the trends of of these players leaving the program and having success like now national champion Tahina Pow Pow, uh, who, you know, she she was interviewed after that game when Dawn Staley in South Carolina went undefeated and, and got that national championship victory over Caitlin Clark in Iowa. She she was interviewed about it and she, she even mentioned that, you know, the, the program and its approach to to winning and, and all everything else that, that went into it, um take note that maybe nil was not mentioned in the interview but that is certainly a factor for some some of the athletes i'm not saying necessarily in this situation but uh but but uh, look i the the there are other programs around the country that have been in similar positions to the ones that oregon was in a few years ago in the unesco years uh that have retooled rebuilt or maintained their uh standing and if oregon wants to catch up to them they're going to have to start probably backing up the Brinks truck a little bit for some of these uh some of these high level transfers because it's it's not going to magically come out of a recruiting class that is comparable to not not terribly comparable to some of the better teams anyway it's got to come through the portal. Oh, and the bottom line is is that this is not sustainable. And I say when I say this I mean what what's happening to this program to the Oregon women's basketball program is not sustainable to have success doing this are there transfers everywhere yeah yeah well there's an average if you go by the number of transfers which is again continuing to go up and will continue to go up in the next few days as as the portal window is open uh well it's an average of three per program across 330 some odd division one teams okay but many of them many of them are players who are looking for more playing time. They're players who didn't play. They're players, or if they did play, they didn't play particularly well. Their numbers are pretty poor. I'd say Priscilla Williams probably falls in that category. She wasn't cleared to play in the first place, got cleared to play mid-December. Her best game was her first game. And then her her numbers did not, you know, were were not terribly good. And then in the uh, blowout that was the finale, uh, she didn't even play. So she moves on. Well, there are lots of players at lots of programs who are moving on who are averaging less than five points, less than three points a game. You can understand that. There is not three players or two players per team. The top two scorers on a good team, bad team, or otherwise are not all leaving every team in the country. So when you're trying to go about building and correcting and writing the proverbial ship, to do that gets really, really, really hard to do when you have pieces that one might argue are the pieces you try to build around and you try to supplement via the portal. When you then lose those pieces year after year, what choice do you have but to try to stop gap and fill every hole that you've now created after the course of four years via the portal? 
because you're not going to even if you did sign 12 freshmen that that, that, that doesn't that, that doesn't work either so you have to try to supplement it's one thing to supplement it's another thing to it's the only thing you got and right now this women's basketball program has year after year lost its best players last year it lost its two best players this year it's losing its two best players that's not sustainable I don't care who you go out and recruit. I don't care who you go off and sign from the transfer portal. You can't lose your two best players in successive years by vol- by their own actions, by their own decisions, not to the WNBA. You cannot lose your two best players to transfer back-to-back years and then say, oh, no, no problem. We'll reload. That, that, that's not a sustainable thing. Well, South Carolina won the championship with a whole new starting lineup. Yeah, they did. One, they're South Carolina. Two, they didn't stop recruiting. Yeah, they and had three. two starting lineups yeah. anyway, to and be three, completely yeah, honest. Right. And three, uh, you know, they, they, who, who did they add via the portal? The pick of the litter. They're, they're going to, you know, there are places who are in a different advantageous position. You cannot go out and try to sustain success. I don't, again, I don't care if we're talking about men's basketball, women's basketball, whoever. What conference, mid-major, what, you can't sustain that. It's not going to work. And again, for the, for the fans who are frustrated and want change and don't understand why there hasn't been change, but hey, you know, again, that's, that's for, for others to answer for. All we can do is try to <laughs> go ahead and provide the, the goings-on in the transactional time of year that is here in the portal. So we'll, we'll certainly get into that more in the days and weeks ahead as we discuss more spring practice and we'll get into more as the men's and women's basketball programs each add transfers in the days and weeks ahead and then any changes to staffs and the like we'll get to all of that but we appreciate all of you for tuning in as always to the ducks confidential podcast a reminder if you don't already do so to like subscribe five star review all those things so that way you can get uh, all of our episodes as well as the episodes of uh, all of our other podcasts here on the Oregonian Sports Podcast uh, channel and the like. And uh, that will do it for us this week. We will see you again soon. Uh, for Ryan Clark, uh, I am James Crepe. And again, we will chat with you again uh, next week. 